Yo, what is up guys, Dream here. Patch 3.20 Forbidden Sanctum has finally been announced. We've received all the information and it's fair to say a large portion of the Path of Exile community is not happy with what they've seen. Today, we're gonna dive into why that is, but also some of the hope in the patch and why I'm personally excited and I think you guys might be too. The end of year Christmas holiday expansion for Path of Exile is always a big deal. Normally containing a continuation of the endgame story and lore, new ways to customize your character, craft and interact with different skill gems, as well as of course new things to farm. So to say that expectations were at an all time high for this one specifically after a bit of a rough year for Path of Exile overall and coming off the back of one of the worst received leagues of all time Lake of Calandra is a bit of an understatement. Couple this with some pretty major releases coming out right now and in the future in World of Warcraft Dragonflight and Diablo 4, people were expecting something big. So did we get that? Well, not exactly. There's no continuation to the story, no big new systems or ways to customize your character, limited amounts of new skill gems with very little rebalancing, and there's been some tweaks to the Atlas passive tree, but nothing groundbreaking or brand new. To understand the disappointment of some in the Forbidden Sanctum announcement, we first need to see what went wrong with Lake of Calandra, as that really will tell the story of what is going on here. One of the main things players were looking for in Lake of Calandra was a shakeup to the endgame skill meta in Path of Exile, bringing the top performers down a little bit and bringing the underperformers up quite substantially with numerical buffs. Now, we did get that to some extent. However, GG focused pretty much exclusively on bringing the overperformers down and quite substantially at that. And they followed suit in patch 3.20 Forbidden Sanctum in a similar fashion, but more extreme extremely so. They targeted builds like Lightning Strike, Spectral Helix, and a few others, and brought them down quite substantially. Not only that, but they decided to also remove a few unique jewels, which do indirectly hinder, and uh, in some cases nerf, uh, builds such as Ward Loop, uh, Frost Blades, uh, Custom Crit, and a few others as well. This has definitely left a bit of a bad taste in some players' mouths. However, there are some things to look at here, and a new approach, which we'll talk a little bit about later on. The next thing to talk about is the lead mechanic. Lake of Calandra was notoriously unrewarding for its entire lifespan. And the reason for this is that it didn't exist in maps. The base game of Path of Exile is incredibly rewarding. And by making players choose to leave their maps and do something else, it needed to be as equally as rewarding or offer something unique. Now it didn't offer anything too unique and it wasn't more rewarding than maps. So it got relegated pretty quickly to the skip pile. Now, the Forbidden Sanctum also does not take place in maps, and that is a massive cause for concern, because even after many buffs, the Lake of Calandra League was still not well received, and overall, is some fears that we may have a repeat of that. But of course, there is a solution in place, we'll talk about that a little bit later. The last comparison I'll make here is communication and accessibility. Accessibility has always been a big issue for Path of Exile, but it was getting pretty good around about the 3.13 or 3.14 point of PoE's lifespan. And since we've kind of been moving towards Path of Exile 2, we have seen an increase in the game's difficulty and a reduction in player tools like crafting. Now, this trend is mostly about a neutral in 3.20 with a little bit of a concession on stuff like Arc Nemesis, the players were expecting a big reversal and that hasn't happened. However, we'll talk about the upsides of what has changed in a little bit here. The next thing I want to talk about is communication. So there has been quite a few communication blunders on the part of Grinding Gear over the past year. And namely, one of the most historic is the historic loot nerf of Lake of Calandra, which caused many players to quit and basically 
basically mass hysteria. Uh, and that has not really been resolved, with many players believing that loot is still going to be in a poor place. Uh, and overall, uh, even I don't really understand exactly where loot is like relative to where the game has been in the past. So that's still largely unsolved and was actually asked in a developer Q&A in the 3.20 announcement. And it was one of the most awkward things I've had to watch on one of the announcement streams. So it's definitely a little bit still shaky and in a weird place in terms of communication and accessibility. So things are not looking too great, or so it seems. So with all that out of the way, let me share with you guys my perspective, a bit of a different one, and why I'm excited for Forbidden Sanctum. Let's kick it off with skill balance. The first thing to talk about is the introduction of eight new Val variations of existing skill gems. We've got Val Cleave, Flicker Strike, Blade Flurry, Venom Gaia, Molten Strike, Caustic Arrow, and the new skill of Volcanic Fisher and Val Smite. Now, a lot of skills are numerically fine, but mechanically weak, either lacking single target damage or clear speed, a combination of the two, or just a gimmick that makes them unique. Now, overall, GGG could have gone with a numeric buff of 30% to all underperforming skills, but it appears they're going with a different approach, and introducing a Val variant to these skills specifically may actually give them some time to shine. Let's go over a few of the more standout ones that I think might actually shake up the build meta after all, which I've got my eye on. First up, Val Smite. So Smite is traditionally a very powerful skill, namely a support skill, but it is also used as a primary skill. Players like to use this one as a slam skill, but it also gives you a really big lightning aura. Now, we don't know what Val Smite does yet, but if I had to hazard a guess, it's probably going to give you an additional or more powerful lightning aura, which is going to further boost your skills. Now, this can be used in a myriad of ways. Not only will it give the traditional Smite build more single target damage, which you know makes it very, very good at a single target scenario kind of bossing build, but it'll now offer builds who can run Smite either as a support or as you know, a secondary setup, two auras potentially instead of one. Now that's just speculation, but it has definitely got the room to shake up melee builds overall, offering them a substantial amount of lightning damage and something a lot of builds need, which is single target damage. The next thing I want to talk about is Caustic Arrow, Val Caustic Arrow. So Caustic Arrow is actually one of the best clear skills in the game early on in a league stat scenario. It's a damage over time uh, kiosk skill, which puts it in a premier position. Lots of uh, kiosk builds are very good at league stat. Um, but the one thing it lacks is actually single target, relying on things like uh, ballistas or um, toxic rain kind of uh, kind of setup to really get its single target going. Uh, now this does put you know some limitations on the build by having to run a dual skill setup. Now, if you were to run Val Costa Arrow and it solved that single target issue with a big nuke, something like a Val Burning Arrow kind of thing, that could be quite interesting, especially if it has multiple charges and the dots overlap. You could also go for a full Chaos Bow build playstyle, sporting Caustic Arrow, Val Caustic Arrow, and Toxic Rain, creating a full package, something a little bit along the lines of an Ignite Elementalist or something like a Cold Dot build, which could be quite compelling. The next one I want to talk about here is Val Venom Gaia. So Venom Gaia is already a very competitive skill. Now I'm not entirely sure what makes this skill not as insane as a League Starter. A lot of Venom Gaia builds have to League Start Spectral Helix, which has been recently nerfed. Uh, however, I do believe that it may be single target. So if Val Venom Gaia offers a increase in single target that might maybe help it out in the League Start scenarios, but it could also double down on its already really insane clear and give it even better clear, making it potentially Potentially one of the new best mappers, better than it already is, uh, you know, to really take the crown perhaps of a number one spot. And these are just a few of the Vile skills being announced. Now there is of course the new skills as well, which uh, you know they look all right, but the proof will always be in the pudding with those. But there is also another approach that Path of Exile teams are going with, and that is to buff up some uniques in the end game. Some of Path of Exile's most iconic uniques like at Series Disfavor and Void Forge are becoming substantially more rare, but also getting insane numerical buffs to compensate. Now these buffs are particularly interesting because they do potentially create new ways to build end game characters, and I don't think they're going to be as inaccessible as many players think. 
The whole idea behind rare items is supply and demand, and if there's no good compelling builds existing already for any of these builds, they won't be very expensive, opening up the door for build makers to potentially get a very powerful cheap item if they can come up with a use case for it. So the items I'm most excited about are the ones that really have doubled down on the unique effects and the identity of the weapon itself. The ones I'm going to probably try out myself are the Xeris Disfavor Axe, which has seen a massive numerical buff to its damage, but also a huge weapon range buff, which is going to allow you to reuse some of the points you've spent on AoE in other areas in melee builds and put them into more damage or more utility, uh, while also gaining the quality of socketed supports gems modifier um, from stuff like the Allah's Malefaction, which could introduce some new build opportunities there as well. Maybe a bit of low life action, which could be quite strong. And the other one I'm interested mostly in is the Void Forge Sword, which has just seen a massive increase in the extra elemental damage that it's gaining from its ability. And that one does look quite powerful. Another notable one is the Voltaxic Rift Unique Bow, which fully converts all lightning damage that you deal to chaos damage. A very interesting choice there. So I think there's going to be some pretty insane build opportunities with some of these weapons if people think hard enough. And if you get in early, they'll probably be pretty affordable to boot. In addition to that, we are also getting 15 uniques, which are getting added to the base game, either through the lead mechanic or through other means. And some of these are absolutely disgustingly powerful to say the least. With the flask, which has been announced off Uvo Maven being very, very strong, as well as the gloves, which I don't actually remember where they drop, but the ones which give you impaled to spells, definitely going to be top tier 100% unless they get adjusted before release release. They will be one of the best ways to build Bladefall Blade Blast without a doubt. So there is definitely a lot of build potential here through the Vile skill gems in the early game for sure. Those will give skills really high power levels I think if they're done correctly. And in the end game we have new uniques and improved uniques in the form of the new weapon uh, improvements. Uh, so it's definitely looking like there is some new build potential but we obviously are losing the builds that we mentioned earlier. Let's talk about the League Mechanic. This one feature is likely going to decide whether or not you want to check out 3.20 because it is the most compelling thing on the plate. If I had to describe it, it looks to be a little bit like a favorable mashup of Heist, Ultimatum, and Lake of Calandra, all tied up in a roguelike package. Now, let's talk a little bit about the obvious. It has very, very large similarities to Lake of Calandra and how the rewards will likely function. Uh, overall, it does look like it's at a risk of being unrewarding, potentially compared to maps. However, this is mitigated somewhat through the unique reward that is being offered from the Forbidden Sanctum mechanic. There is a new type of item called a relic, which offers build defining keystones and modifiers on a very high power level. But the catch is this can only be acquired from the Sanctum and it's bind on pickup and bind on account. So you cannot trade this in any way, shape or form and uh, you cannot acquire these from anywhere else. In addition to that, you can actually manipulate these in the Forbidden Sanctum on your roguelike runs, giving you a massive reason to want to pursue the mechanic even if it awarded basically nothing, which is insane insurance and definitely going to make it so that everyone's going to want to run these at least to some extent to acquire a good relic and there's always going to be that chase to and acquire an even better one. Now, on my uh, own personal um, kind of level here, I have to say this is probably the most inspired mechanic I've seen from Grind Gear Games since, since the Synthesis League, and it's probably the most hyped I've actually been to try a mechanic uh, since then as well. It looks fascinating, it looks like a ton of work has gone into it, and not only that, but a ton of passion. I can already imagine my tantalizing 32 floor runs unfolding, and I can't wait to try not only my my favorite build, Tornado Shot, in there, but also a number of other builds to see how they play as well. I'm a massive fan of the roguelike genre, and one of the coolest things of that genre is trying to go through with different characters and seeing how they stack up and how the different blessings interact with all of the different characters as well. 
Now, I think that it probably will be very easily cheesed and you will be able to max out the rewards despite what Chris Wilson says. And it'll be pretty interesting to see just how high they'll go. But overall, I think it's going to be a lot of fun, not only for high-end players, but also players just looking to get into the game and also just have a bit of fun. So overall, I think it's a smash hit mechanic, assuming the, uh, the resolve mechanic is tuned correctly, as well as the rewards are tuned correctly. I'm very excited about this one and it will not be relegated to the skip pile, assuming the power level of the relics is what they showed in the announcement. The last thing I want to talk about here is the massive rework coming to the economy. Something that is coming from all directions. There's new currencies getting added, there's different mechanics getting reworked, the draw drop pools changing. It's basically coming from everywhere. Too much to talk about in one video, certainly, but I want to give you guys a taste. And the main thing I want to talk about here is accessibility of content. Now, despite what I've said earlier, there's definitely been a lot of build nerfs, there's been a lot of communication issues, but the one thing GGGG has definitely consistently tried to do is make farming strategies more open to everybody, allowing players to play their favorite mechanics when they want, how they want, at any point of progression. And it looks like the Forbidden Sanctum League is another big step in the right direction. So right now, there's a few mechanics which are incredibly inaccessible or quite expensive to access and farm. Now, even though they're incredibly profitable, there is a high barrier to entry, basically limiting the most profitable stuff uh, from the majority of the player base. I'm talking about stuff like Delirium Mirrors, Harvest, Ritual, and even some other mechanics like Legion. The problem stems from the fact that you can only access mechanics consistently through the use of scarabs or compasses or sextants. Now, these are generally pretty expensive and are generally tied to the players who can make use of them the best. And that's generally gonna come with a very expensive build or a lot of game knowledge. The introduction of new Atlas passive points, which allow you to encounter Lee mechanics more frequently, uh, hopefully up to 100%, is going to change that. Now, in addition to the fact that you wanted to maximize these with a good build and game knowledge, you also wouldn't be caught dead running these mechanics in low maps. You're not going to invest a really high value Delirium Mirror or a um, Harvest Compass in white maps, meaning those mechanics were essentially relegated to only being able to be farmed in high tier maps for the most part. Now, with the introduction of the mechanic uh, of the, like being able to increase the spawn chance of these on the Alice Passive Tree, potentially as high as 100% with some mechanics, well, that thing changes substantially. You'll now be able to farm your favorite mechanics, hopefully from day dot. By fully investing all your Alice Passive points, for example, in Ritual, you can get a Ritual farming strategy going in perhaps white maps, yellow maps, and even early reds without the need to delve into using stuff like compasses and all sorts of stuff like that. Essentially opening up not only a myriad of options in the early game, Game, but a ton of them in the end game as well. Not needing to stress about making sure that you're making your money back on stuff like compasses by min-maxing gameplay to the absolute extreme is going to make farming a lot more comfortable for a lot more people. And for content creators, there are going to be a lot more strategies on the table, further diversifying what people are actually farming and increasing the amount of options people have, which is going to be a really big directional move uh, for the game. And it's going to kind of take a lot of the pressure off people on doing the best thing all the time because you can just do what you enjoy and you'll likely make a pretty good amount of currency. You might not make the most currency, but you'll likely make a pretty good amount to play the builds you want and get closer to your next goal. In addition to that, the pressure to rush all the way to T16 maps to maximize your profits might not be as severe. If you can get rituals on every single one of your yellow maps and you're having fun and you're making some reasonable currency, that might be good enough to hang out there and maybe wait for a few upgrades before you have to move on to those red maps. And I think overall, this is the change I'm most excited about. I hope that the nodes deliver and we're getting a substantial amount increased chance to encounter stuff like Expedition and Ritual. And if we can make it to 100%, I think that's going to be a transformative change to the game. And it's really going to open the game up for a lot of players and uh, hopefully make the game a whole lot more accessible. So these are just the three things which I'm most excited about in the new expansion. And I think that they outweigh the negatives, even though there's a bit of a risk. I think that GGG is trying different things, they're trying new things, and they're trying to move the game in a reasonable direction. And I'm pretty damn excited for the new Lee mechanic and everything that comes with it. And I'm sure there's things I've missed or things that don't specifically appeal to me uh, and that you guys are excited about as well. 
feel free to comment down below what you guys think of the reveal. There's a bit of bad, but there's certainly a whole lot of good with it as well. And I'll see you guys on League Start. Make sure to subscribe for more 3.20 action. I've got a brand new League Starter in the works and it's coming soon. Until next time, cheers.